Yep, yep, yep. It's the third part. It's the third part to the show. Uh, it's going to be a short third part because we're just running long today. That's how it's done. Let me tell you what we're going to do in this part three by recapping part one and two. Part one, Funky Stargate play by Zest. Mmm. Part two, Sexy DT Robo play by Rain. Ooh. In this part, we're going to look at this, uh, I'll call it a, I don't know, a, a, a dealing with aggression, counter-aggression build. Uh, this, I think, will showcase a lot of what modern PvP looks like in many ways in a very generalized form, where I feel like players try to do some kind of not extremely fast tech, but a little bit of a delay to it, as they push back and prod a little bit, and oftentimes apply pressure themselves. Mm -mm 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 -mm. I don't know if you guys put ice in your water, but it makes the water better. The map is Heavy Rain, which, as you'll note, tends to be about this ridge. I can blink all day! Oh, I can blink all day, too! Oh. And Colossi function very nicely here. Not a lot of good surround angles. We won't even get there. Oh, oh what a boa. What a boa. Zest himself goes for an early assimilator on 15, and then does not get the second assimilator. Extremely uncommon. In PvP, you just get the second damn assimilator. But here, the Cybernetics Core can go down right away. No delay. Hurray, hip, hip, hooray. Another assimilator goes down. Now, I'm going to state something that's really obvious and probably a little bit stupid, but here we go. If you delay the second gas, you'll have more minerals. Yay! All right! What do we do with all those extra, extra minerals? Zest will tell you. We chrono boost the hell out of this warp gate. We get a zealot. We haven't gotten one of those in years. Oh. Probe comes in and immediately Zest is like, oh shit. You know what's funny? The last thing we get is the mothership core. First warp gate, second stalker, last mothership core. That's like almost the opposite of before. Zest is trying to save his chrono. He doesn't want to show that he's chronoing the warp gate. He's like, alright, is the probe gone? Alright. Alright, everyone. And there it is. Ba-bam, ba-boom. Gateways. Soon. Zest didn't scout. Zest didn't need a scout. We're also going to alt F it. Change the colors a little bit. So Zest, our hero, is green. Uh, Zealot, lagging behind a little bit. Not a big deal. But what is an extremely important concern? Staying alive! Whoa. Look at Zest. The mothership core is sitting at home. Look at how at home this mothership core is sitting. Look at this mothership core sitting at home. In case of counter-aggression, no big deal. We have a mothership core. Isn't that weird, the fact that if you're attacking early, you don't have to bring the Mothership Core? Is that not insane? Most people are like, but dude, how do you 1A then? You don't include the Mothership Core in 1. Ooh. Ooh, that's right. The Flickety Flam Flam. And one of my favorite touches, the Robotics Facility goes down right at about five and a half. We we kind of do need to get up the robo facility for observers. Our opponent could be going for Dark Templar. We just don't know. We need to account for that as an as a possibility. The warp gates are coming up as well. Mothership core. Now there she goes. There she goes, Joe. Zest even botches and loses a Stalker. Check out these cool moves. Mothership Core can totally turn around and defend at home. And Zest gets to move up into Domain Base. This is where I need to stop just a little bit. Stopping just a touch. And coming back to the Rain Cam. To understand the efficiency of this attack, we need to see what's going on in, in the Main of Rain. 
whose build won't stay mainly the same. It will actually change quite a bit. Uh, there is the Faust... Oh, there is the Faust Cybernetics Koa. An uncharacteristic supply block from Rain on supernational television. Oh, how embarrassing. Not the hugest deal. Only has one in gas, an intentional maneuver. We'll slowly be adding more into there. But wants to be able to do this double uh, gateway build. Pretty normal. But once Rain gets in here, he's going to notice a couple things. First of all, there is a Zealot. Second of all, there is not a lot of gas mined out of these two geysers. In fact, Rain himself mined a little bit more. So, m most of the time, if you're doing like a Twilight Council play, it's okay right here to throw down a Twilight Council. That's like a very reasonable time to do it. But since Rain really looks like he's up against some aggression, why would Rain want to get two Stalkers here? Well, because Rain can just thwart this three-gate aggression by picking off the probe that's at the front. So Rain just goes for a three-gate himself and is now in functionally the same position. Except Rain is saving that gateway energy. Remember this robo timing? Well, yeah, it can be very useful against a Dark Templar play. But in particular, it very often will put um, Zest ahead of Rain on uh, some production front. Now, Rain's doing a smart move as well. Hey, if you're going to be going uh, for an early gate attack, I'm going to get stalkers to stay alive and then make those stalkers more valuable by getting Blink. So here we see Zest doing his thing, losing his Stalker, and then just doing this really cool counterattack. So as we get up into here, it's pretty clear there's just not that much that Rain can really do about this. Here's the Pylon. Rain has a probe in there. Very easy defense here. And Zest just continues to morph in. Or excuse me, warp in. Morph in is, uh, I'm doing the wrong race. So there's this kind of funky thing. Zest has gotten this robotics facility. In the case of DTs, he gets an observer. In the case of this attack not being able to do anything. Where Zest can't really get much more than the first warping round. Zest would begin making an immortal as he expands. In the case that some opportunity presents itself, well, dude, he's just going to keep warping in. He is going to apply pressure. Very, very simple. An opportunity has presented itself, so here we go. Now this is, we're going to see some super slick dope stuff. I'll once again repeat, versus DTs, we have the Observer. If we somehow get deflected, we can just expand and immediately build Immortals. But if, for some reason, an opportunity presents itself, which will happen if our opponent makes an error, as in this game, or it will happen if our opponent makes um, uh, tries to tech a little too aggressively, well, cool, we're, we're actually A-OK. -okay. I think a, a kind of an important component. Oh shit, did he just fly his mothership core in there like a dummy? Where where's the mothership core? Where did Zest's mothership core go? I think he accidentally flew it in there. This mothership core stayed at home for quite a long time. She had a long tenure chilling back in main base. So we got to stay alive. <laughs> and then the mothership core is like, I wanna die so bad! And then Zest is like, oh Jesus. Oh my god. So that actually does suck a lot for Zest. He, he should be, generally speaking, uh, equipped with a second Photon Overcharge there. But now has a pretty easy transitioning time.
He just crow, no boost the immortal. Oh, you yeah, remember that Twilight Council I talked to you about earlier? Rain canceled it because he got into a tight spot. Oh, yes. Oop, didn't even go back far enough. Rain was expecting, I think, to have held this off. God. Oh, the rewinds. Rain was expecting to have held this off. And then when these units moved in, and this warping happened, Rain was like, oh, jeez, oh, god. And just canceled it to get the extra money to do the warpins. Which I don't actually think was necessary, but that's just, that's just what he did. So, anyways... Just has himself a very nice opportunity to get a very nice composition for the win. Here's some that I found real cool out of Zest. An error I think is very common uh, to make, uh, pretty much any level, would be to just keep making Immortals right now. Just keep blasting those in. Uh, Zealot counterattacks are fine and all that, but Zest instantly goes for a Warp Prism. This is so brilliant. Why? Our opponent is just going to be going three gates. So you know what? We'll also go three gates. Our immortals are already going to just destroy any small number of stalkers. The only way we actually have any difficulty is if he has positioned himself outside the front. Zest doesn't even see that this is down there. Only now does he actually see that. Because this war prism watched a sexy move. It's just Zealot, Sentry, Assault him. Super duper frickin' cool. Just a nice little counter uh, aggression move. And then he moves out to attack. Now, if you think you can't actually move out to attack, you just expand and probably get a Forge and then a Twilight Council in that order. But Zest is like, no, I actually think I can attack. So he starts morphing in Stalkers. Stalker, Stalker, Stalker. Probably Stalkers over here. Still leaving himself the opportunity to expand. No, it looks like he's warping in Zealots. Oh, how nifty. And then he can do this stuff where he unloads... Immortals and Zealots and just crushes. One of the reasons why this counterplay is going to be so effective is because this Nexus is not done yet. As in, a Warp Prism attack is going to be very effective because it's an easy way to break the ramp. Normally, an expansion covers the ramp, but if your early Warp Gate pressure has prevented an expansion for some reason, there's nothing covering the ramp, so you can easily just get in there. So it was fun. A lot of cool openings we got the chance to see. Um... Even got, uh, even I got the chance to see that it was actually an 11 gate that was uh, the source of the ultra fast phoenixes. It's really the sort of thing that makes me want to go play StarCraft 2 like right now. Uh, but I'm actually probably going to play Heroes of the Storm. It's eating into my StarCraft 2 edge. So now, let's ask some questions. Great question from Drodo. So does the Phoenix count after that battle? Uh, or in game one that we looked at in part one, the Phoenix count after that battle was four. Is that still forced to continue with the Stargate production? I definitely uh, think so. Um, in general, if you begin to go Phoenix, uh, okay, so let's, let's state some facts about a Phoenix in a vacuum. Phoenix is are stronger the larger of numbers you have of them. Because if one of them lifts, all the other phoenixes get to fire. So, in general, getting larger phoenixes feels good. Why would you not? Because it's not going to be as efficient as, as a unit like a stalker that's a little bit beefier. But if you both start going phoenixes, for any of you to transition away causes you so much pain. Because again, like seven phoenixes roasts three phoenixes super 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 fast and the person who decides to transition away will be that person with three phoenixes so suddenly you just get so much freaking value um 
I'm trying to think of an easy way to say to test it. Well, if you do have a buddy you can play against, have you both open phoenixes? Actually, just have you both do the same opening, like two gate into stargate phoenix, and one of you builds three and stops, and the other just keeps building phoenixes the whole game, and you will really get and feel what I mean. Um, Zest, you might say, well, if Zest had the phoenix lead, why would he keep building phoenixes? Doesn't he get the opportunity to transition away? Um, um, yeah, he, he does, but I just don't think that you'll ever be able to do as much damage. For two reasons. One, you have two Stargates and Phoenixes. It's so easy to keep going Phoenix. Great. What other tech do you have? No Twilight, no Forge, no Robo, no Warp Gate. It's a cost, it's an extremely costly transition. It's gonna cost money just to make the buildings to be able to make units to have the transition. In general, in any strategy game, at least any good strategy game, if you have committed down a path, you should try to solve answers down this path that you are on, as opposed to saying, well, maybe if I pull back and go all the way down a different path, I'll be in good shape. Uh, as an analogy, it's kind of like, okay, if I start going for an expansion and my opponent turns out to be rushing, do you think it's a good idea to stop being a fast expo player and to try to just go for a big army then? It's like, well, you, you, it's, you've, already, you've already committed to it. Borg Leader says, Dear Day 9, woof, woof, bark, phoenix, woof, colossus, bark, bark, to which I wag enthusiastically. Uh, let's see there. Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. Oh, Tang Tecumseh, good to see you again. Says Dana, what is the most stable way to get to the mid game is Protoss? Here it is. You go for one gate, get the Mothership Core, get uh, a Stalker, build Twilight Council, get another Stalker, go for Fast Blink with two additional gateways, get a Robo, don't get too many Blink Stalkers, just a few. Move around with the Blink Stalkers and the Observer just to control space. Imagine that your Blink Stalkers are Mutalisks, just trying to zone the enemy. Expand and Chrono Boost Immortals. The short statement of it is rush to Blink and use Blink Stalkers to control space. Expand while building Immortals. Absolute, extremely stable, extremely easy. Cannon Rushing is very good as well. Uh, from Mercury, I see Day9, we saw very little use of Warp Prism from Rain in his DT build. Why is that? When I play DTs, I very often feel like Chrono Boosting out. A Warp Prism will allow me to deal damage with my DTs and also have the option to harass with it at any point in the game. Pew! Okay, so first let's talk about our defense at home. If we go for a Warp Prism, that is time that could be producing Immortals and money that could have been an Immortal. Most of your deaths, in fact, um, I'm trying to think of any, any death circumstance in the mid-game, all your death cases are to big amounts of Blink Stalker. So, sure, you might be able to deal damage to him, but you will die at home in, uh, with a higher percentage. It's not going to spike up really big, but you will go from like a 70% survival rate in the mid-game to like a 55% survival rate in the mid-game. So that's one reason we don't want to do it. Um, the second and uh, the second reason we don't want to do it is that if we're against a good player, he just won't take damage from the War Prism. Um, most intelligent Protosses leave the Observer at home and then have the Blink Stalkers out on the map. If there's a Dark Templar that's seen, they just blink away and receive no damage anyways. Um, so your, your War Prism won't really be able to do very much. Um... um also, a third reason, in that game where we saw Rain's DT move into the main base, Rain only built one DT, its probability of dying is quite high. So if we invest in a Warp Prism, um, we either 
have to keep that initial DT alive, or we have to be building another Dark Templar to make use out of the Warp Prism at all. And the Dark Templar warp in... Okay, okay, sorry, let me, let me reorder that. We know for a fact that if we have the Warp Prism, we're going to want to put a Dark Templar in it. And in that game, we saw Rain build one Dark Templar, and it died. When does the Dark Templar get built? At the exact second that the Robo Facility finishes. Do we really want to wait for that Robo Facility to, to get a Warp Prism out, and then send it cross-map, and then load the DT into it, and then attack our opponent? That gives him a huge, huge span of time to get up any defense he needs. Um... I don't think there's a way to get the Warp Prism out faster. And the alternative is to say, okay, well, you send the first DT in, and it will probably die. So we build a second DT, but now you're spending a really huge amount of money. And we've already talked about how your, your mid-game loss case is generally from uh, uh, Blink Stalkers. So yeah, I think just building one DT, sending it in, knowing that it will likely die is the best case. We, the only way in which building that Warp Prism, I think, would have a chance for a positive value is if you got the Dark Templar moved forward, identified that he could detect you, and managed to escape alive, and then load into the Warp Prism, and then avoided his observer that allowed him to stay alive in the first place. It does. It doesn't really add up. Jesus, I answered the shit out of that question. Whoa, whoa, that was an answer to a question. Normally, I can answer a question like. 50, 70 percent good? Man, that was... I, just, I answered that fucker in half, man. Ooh! Mmm! Mmm! Why is there so few Void Rays used in high-level ladder games? I don't know. I don't really see where, where, where they'd be good. Um... I'm trying to think of any circumstance in which they would be valuable. They're so expensive. Um, here's the way I would think about it. They cost 250 150 eh? Amen. So, that means that, gas-wise, they cost the same as three Blink Stalkers. How do I want to say this? Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to say, in what circumstances... Um, I'm also going to answer the shit out of this question, too. This is going to be good. Okay, why don't we see more Void Rays? Watch this. What are the broad categories of opening that a general Protoss player would do if he was just playing... Uh, a regular old game and following a script to his build order? He'd be doing some robo-focused builds... He'd be doing some maybe cutesy DT builds. Be doing some blink builds. And he'd be doing some Stargate builds. So if he's going DT and you want to go Void Ray, when are you going to start your Void Ray production? Well, when you're safe. You can't start it immediately, so you probably have to open Oracle and I guess go defensive Oracle. It's hard to really see you starting that until you're at two base against DT. What about against a roboing player? Maybe we could begin building uh, Void Rays then? Maybe that's okay if we surprise him, but 
it's going to be very hard to surprise him. A roboing player is going to be one of the most active sentrying players and will be sending in a lot of hallucinated phoenix, as will pretty much anyone. Against a Stargate player, he can simply respond by building nothing but phoenixes, roast your void rays, and have air control, which we saw in part one is really good. So the last scenario we might talk about is, well, hey, void rays and big numbers seem pretty damn good against blink stalkers. But if he is going blink stalkers, he's going to be doing that almost all, which he's going to be doing almost all the time. Most Protosses will be going Blink Stalkers in this matchup. He's going to still have the opportunity to scout what you're doing with a Hallucinated Phoenix. He can engage the Void Rays, see them charge up, blink away, wait, and then blink back in. Gas is the restricting factor in this matchup, and given the fact that it's three Stalkers per Void Ray, he's just going to overwhelm you, even though you counter him, because... Countering implies that both players have decided that they're going to remove their hands from their keyboard. An intelligent Blink Stalkering player will always engage, see that charge up, and pull away. Boom! B -b 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 Bye! Have a great April Fool's Day. I am a dog. Thanks for watching K9TV. Ruff. Woof. Her.